day one of my first real job. I'm an engineering contractor that's going to be working on a government base. I drive over an hour away down to this orientation building and everyone looks real nice and they're ready for their first day and they take us up to this small little room upstairs and there's a little air tank at everybody's seat. And they tell us that the air might be evacuated from our workspaces one day so we need to learn how to use this. So you turn on the valve and you put a plastic bag over your head. And I have several issues with this. One, they told me I was going to be writing paperwork. Why is my cubicle being evacuated of air? And two, my mother explicitly told me never put plastic bags over your head. So after this, they take us to a different room and we fill out some forms and we learn about retirement plans and they give us our badges and these little orange sleeves and they say, some of our company is picketing and you have to go through the gates they're picketing at or else you're going to be fired on the spot, no questions asked, even if it's your first day. And this very nice gentleman said he's worked there before and he would gladly take some of us through and show us where to go. We are starving caravan through McDonald's drive through and we're all driving there, trying to get there on time, eating our burgers, and I'm worried if we're gonna make it to the right gate or not. And I know we've made it to the right one when I see a 15 foot inflatable rat surrounded by picketers. So at least I know I'm not getting fired on my first day. And then we finally make it to the inner badging station and we get our badges and they tell me I have to go to a training video to watch a bunch of VHS tapes for the rest of the day. The first tape I watch is all about what not to do with your badges and it's taught to me by Bolo the Clown. Don't be a Bolo and wear your badge into the grocery store. And then the next video is a game show where there's a bunch of contestants and I have to figure out which one of these contestants is a spy. Spoiler alert, they're all spies. Everyone's a spy. Anyone could be a spy, so you better be on the lookout. And then the last series of videos that they give to us is all these different buildings on base. I still don't know what building I work in and how you can evacuate them and where to go in case of an emergency. And make sure you look out for the wind sock because you want to be upwind because you might have evacuated a building because something's leaking out of it and you don't want to be downwind of it. So that is how the first day ended for me. I had no idea where I worked. I had no idea why I needed an air tank. And this was the first day of the best job of my entire life. It's 7 a.m. the morning of my first day at a Christian and pretty strict high school. I'm 15 and I am on time for the first time ever. All I have to do is slip on my shoes and I'll be out that door. Shoes, where are my shoes? Mum, didn't I put my shoes next to my door? Mum, what is this weird black stuff that's all over the floor? And then I see it. Six feet of fluffy dog. My buffoon of a Gordon setter stretched out on the lounge room floor, chewing on what once was my shiny new school shoe. Fast forward two and a half hours, it's 9.30. School started an hour ago and I'm finally arriving after going to buy new shoes. I get signed in and I get taken to our class assembly. I walk in, there's a hundred faces staring at me and the unit coordinator says, hello there, I was just telling your new classmates that lateness will not be tolerated. So tell us, why were you late today? I stare down at my shoes, I'm trying not to cry and I just mumble, my dog ate my shoes. My dog ate my shoes. That is the oldest excuse in the book. There's a hundred faces staring at me, laughing. I just want to go home. The guy says something I don't really understand. And then he starts to pray. He's praying for the school year. He's praying that it's a safe one and a fun one. And I'm thinking he's just about to wrap it up and say amen. And then he tags on. And we pray for Georgia, Lord. We pray that she fits well into this cohort and that her dog never eats shoes again. Well, she's never touched another pair of shoes. So I guess his prayer half worked. So I'm in Washington DC about to get the Amtrak to New York. And I'm a little nervous because this is my first time traveling alone. And where I'm from, if you wanna get the train across the country, you don't need to bring your passport and travel through armed security. I'm also really scared that I'm gonna fall asleep and wake up in a destination I've never heard of, miles away from where I'm meant to be. So the first wave of panic kind of subsides as I get onto the train platform, only to be hit by a kind of minor freak out as I realise I have no idea which train carriage I'm meant to be getting into, you know, uh, some are first class, some are quiet cars, and my ticket really isn't that specific. I ask the nearest employee and he points me to the right one to jump into. I stow my luggage and someone comes around to start checking our tickets. As he gets to me I realise it's the same guy from before, and as he scans my ticket, rather than receiving the complimentary, oh have a nice trip, 
he asks me about my last name. I'm a little freaked out, but he quickly explains that he has the same one, and I don't have a very common last name. You know, I've never met anyone with it that's not directly related to me. He asks me where it's from, and I tell him my mother, who is from down south. This immediately sparks his attention as he begins to tell me the history of my last name and the people who have had it. For anyone wondering, it was inherited by slave owners after its abolition, along with a house and a bunch of land, which apparently we still own. I'm pretty fascinated, but still a little bit skeptical. You know, this man is of my complexion, but the resemblance is hardly uncanny. And just at this moment, he pulls out his Facebook and starts scrolling through his relatives, when lo and behold, I happen to see my grandfather there. A man whom he quickly identifies as his cousin. And we're both just in, you know, a state of shock and amazement. Needless to say, he made sure I got off at the right stop. We exchanged contact details, and I've even spoken to him a few times since. My first time traveling alone, I met a distant relative who lives on the other side of the country to the rest of my family. If I had asked any other employee where to sit or gotten in any other train carriage, I would have never met him. When I did my first professional gig as a DP, it was for this web-based talk show and I had never shot a live event before in my entire life. Quick side note for people who don't know, DP stands for Director of Photography, and that's the person on set who's responsible for making sure that the lights and cameras are all set up to make, you know, good pictures. I didn't really like how talk shows were taped, but I also didn't really understand why I had that disdain. And all I really wanted to do was get the kind of shots that I was seeing in movies. This led to me creating this very short-sighted list of criteria as to what made a good shot. I also convinced myself that literally anything that didn't meet all the criteria on that list was worthless. We also had John Dunsworth and Patrick Roach from the Trailer Park Boys on the show as guests, and we had no time to rehearse with them. So you'd think that with only one shot to get it right and no idea what was going to happen, I would play it safe, right? I didn't play it safe. Instead, I just threw this one really nice 135mm f2.4 lens on one camera and only actively operated that instead of making sure that the other two shots didn't, you know, suck. The failure of this strategy was most notable in the fact that my safety shot, you know, the one where the guest is sitting on their couch on the right side of the screen and the host is on the left side of the screen behind their desk or sitting in their armchair, you, you know, that shot. Yeah, that, 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 my version of that shot was being taken on a camera that shut itself off every 10 to 15 minutes and as a result, 20 minutes where that camera was not rolling <laughs> elapsed before I realized and corrected that terrible, terrible problem. At the end of the shoot, I had missed about 45% of the focus and framing on all of the cameras. I can clearly remember thinking, well, that was fun while it lasted. But instead of getting fired from that gig, I got a small pile of notes, a pat on the back, and most importantly, I learned the lesson that a big ego doesn't belong on any set. So I work at Disneyland in California, specifically in Tomorrowland Attractions, and I was learning how to operate the attraction Star Tours, and I was really pumped, uh, second attraction, and on the first day of training you have to get there two hours before the park opens. and. It was pretty early, I don't know if maybe I didn't get enough sleep, but about an hour in, I start feeling like death. I am breaking out into a cold sweat, I'm going back and forth to the bathroom, I am just not, not doing well, and my trainer is very concerned, but I'm like, no, it's fine, I don't want to reschedule training, I'm already here, let's, we got this, let's do this. And then we're learning how to launch a star speeder, basically start the attraction once the guests are in, and I just passed out on onto the entrance ramps where you get in the star speeder just fell to the ground. Luckily I was only out of it for a few seconds and then he managed to get up again, be a functional human being and sat in a swivel chair for the next hour. Didn't go home because they didn't want to reschedule the training. Sometimes they see my trainer backstage and he looks at me like I'm about to pass out. Yikes. Just a reminder that the deadline for the open calls for the June episodes is coming up pretty soon. And I'm talking soon, like Sunday, May 31st, 2015 soon. The two themes for June are called, Are You Being Served? So stories from the service industry. So if you're a bartender or a waiter, or if you've worked in retail or customer service, I really want stories from you. The next theme is called, Oh Shit. 
So you have to have a story that makes you say, oh shit, while you're telling your story. If you have questions about the themes, please see the blog update in the description below. If you have a story that would go with these themes, please submit it ASAP to onetimestories.com slash tell a story. The open calls for July will come out pretty soon on social media, but if you are a supporter of us on Patreon, you will find out those themes this weekend. So if you want to find out sooner rather than later, feel free to, you know, just pass a dollar our way. If you were wondering, this post-it note says balls on it.